Dr. Abdurrahman Anisi and Dr. Ahmed Ammar made uh, a great job by gathering all of us here. And this is the first time I see a large number of residents uh, in one meeting. This is the largest number I ever saw. So, uh, the uh, topic will be evidence-based neurosurgery, as I was requested to present. And this is a clinical movement which is now getting more popular and it is required in everyday practice and even in teaching in the undergraduate and postgraduate. Uh, if we know a little, we can practice medicine. If we know much, we can also practice medicine. But I think the results which count, because people who know less, they will have bad results. That outcome. So the knowledge is the important thing, but all of us, I mean, when we graduate from uh, the program and then after several years of practice, our knowledge will decline in certain areas. It may increase in other areas, but it will decline in uh, certain areas. And this is why we require to refresh our knowledge every now and then and do evidence based medicine. In addition to do evidence-based medicine, we have variation in practice. We'll go uh, mention these uh, one by one. So this is a study done on about less than 300 uh, internists who were graduated, say, before uh, 1983, and they have an exam on uh, in uh, 1988, five years after they graduated, and they took from 5 to 15 years and they give them the exam, all of them and they found that the people who were graduated more recently they scored better than the people who graduated long time ago for 15 years and there was a difference between uh, they have between USA and foreign graduates and universities and community programs and then different specialties all there is decline of knowledge after a while. So this cannot be... Okay. So this is another study. Variation in practice for other entities. 
and also they found in several countries in Europe that also in uh, Hungary they operate on less uh, patients with uh, spontaneous and preserved So that's why many uh, knowledge is needed and uh, evidence-based medicine is needed to unify all of these. So our sources of information, as you know, this is our knowledge which we accumulate over the years, experience and our thinking process, observation uh, from our colleagues and expert opinions from books and articles we read and then finally the published evidence which support and complement all what we have. So when we say evidence, that means data which help us in forming a conclusion. And the classical uh, definition of evidence-based medicine is the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of uh, the current best evidence in making decisions regarding the care of individual patients. Complex studies. So simply it will be a systematic reviewing, appraising and using clinical research findings to aid the delivery of optimal clinical care of patients. And finally it's using the best available research evidence to guide clinical decisions. So we have research evidence which does not work alone on its own. And we have clinical uh, knowledge experience. So if we use research evidence alone, this will be too harsh and too dry and kind of uh, will be kind of dictatorial system that we have to use this thing for everything alone. So it will be kind of tyrant in us. And if we have only the knowledge alone, also does not work because it declines and there will be variation of practice. So both of them has to work together. In addition, we have to take the patient consideration. So all of this, this is the definition of the evidence-based medicine, which is supposed to be. It's not only research evidence, it has to be our clinical experience combined with the patient reviews. So the advantage of evidence-based medicine is that we stay current in our knowledge and reduce the variability of medical care and support our decision making and this is for the benefit of the patients and the better clinical outcomes and can be used as a kitchen tool for residents and there are books for in this regards for neurosurgery in particular this is a case 55 year old female who has six months history of six nerve palsy and headache, not too much headache, smile headache. So a question for this patient here, shall I treat or not treat? This is one thing. Uh, because this is our responsibility. I mean this patient, if we make a decision, we have to be responsible for this decision or whether we do the intervention or we don't do it. But this is our patient and then we are asked about the decision which we make. So for this patient, yeah, we decided to send her for coiling, <coughs> uh, based on that she became symptomatic in terms of the headache and she has uh, this six nerve palsy. So this is her angiogram, this is the cavernous sinus aneurysm, internal carotid artery aneurysm in the cavernous sinus. Okay, so our either we observe our choices or do craniotomy and clipping bypass, endovascular intervention, the form coiling stent. So we have lots of choices here, we have to choose one of them. So we sent her for coiling, and then coiling went fine, everything was okay, and then she got this thing here. So she had a middle cerebral artery infarction on the left side, the hemiplegic, aphasic increased level of consciousness. So this is decision we gave her, we told her to do this one, and they were responsible for this. So was I right at that time or not? This is the question. So we have to go into to see if I'm right or wrong on this one. Uh, the problem in neurosurgery we cannot find too much evidence. So we have to make the evidence ourselves or create and get the best from what we read. So uh, the steps 
which we follow is have a focus question and we go and search for this question and then we all of these articles we have to review there are plenty of articles so we have to choose the, the right thing and then uh, we make a decision according to what our conclusion is and then we apply it to the patient and then we monitor this application and we, we may apply it on other patients as well and just monitor this application so the first step is making a question which is they have the uh, known formula which is PICO which is person or problem intervention comparison outcome and so so this is a patient here, we made a question, in patients with giant cavernous sinus aneurysm, would observation compared with endovascular intervention, or the reverse we can have it, lead to lower morbidity and mortality? So went for the literature, we have a set of places we can get information nowadays. Some of them are ready-made, we can have it, and this is the best if we have it. If we have some systematic review, if we have evidence based on any population and so forth, so we can use it, we can read it and uh, just see if it makes sense and use it. If we don't find, we have to make it ourselves. So these are good sources to, for uh, uh, getting information. Uh, PubMed, you know it all. Highwire is a nice uh, source. Up to date now is coming more popular and up to date now is free in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia if you all know. So you go there and they don't have to have the membership. And then we have the Cochrane base, the famous thing if we have uh, if we have what we're looking for in it. And there's lots of others, trip database and so forth. So we get what we want to get all of these articles and then this is a pipe of this from Parker. so we have we have the P person problem and we have the intervention we have the comparison and then we have the outcome and we look into this and this is a trip database also we, we collect articles and see which one suits our need. And this is the high wire. The good thing about it, they give you three articles here. You see it with the high wire. And this is what we found. This is a sample, it's not for uh, just a definite conclusion. So, what we found that intervention can be done by condition in certain conditions that if the patient has neurological problems like ophthalmoplegia, progressive visual loss and so forth, which does not fully apply to our patients, but it is okay, or they have hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then this is another study, which says that endovascular surgery has decreased the morbidity that they encourage. I mean, you can, you can have to do endovascular for anything, you can do it for anybody. And this is safe and good. This is a study. And then the other one, you see the, the highlight moved apparently. But this is also another condition one, that you have to do it in certain condition. And they, they said treated group had a higher proportion of neurological and visual complications. So there is some conflict. But the baseline is we have to look and see what, if we did something right or wrong. And for the decompressive craniotomy, for the middle <coughs> portion, we go also, this is uh, up to date. And there's a recommendation uh, to do this one, but also it's not, and it has to be a standard of care. But this is another recommendation. So we went ahead and do the decompressive craniotomy. And we put the bone flap back, and you know, she was in a uh, another study say for uh, for statins using in subarachnoid hemorrhage. So in one paper they say significantly reduced the incidence of vasospasm. The other study says the usage remains unclear. The other study says uh, 
do not lend statistical significant support. But there are some studies that they don't say how much they say that it is good. But that's what we need more work. So when we look at these articles, so we have to look at it and see if it is, makes sense to us or not. We see if uh, it is give us the truth or not. We can use it or not. Because there are lots of junk in the literature. So we have to choose what's suitable for us. So the best way to choose is to do the critical appraisal for the chosen one. And this is the core of the thing. The core of the thing is the critical appraisal. So we have to see the internal validity and the external validity of this tumor, whether it is, uh, can be uh, uh, to the extent to what uh, if the study can measure what it's supposed to measure, which is the internal validity. And the external validity, if this study can be applied to other uh, uh, situations other than the one which we have here. So as you know, there is the organization of the article, title, author, all of them are significant. But the most important thing which we can judge whether this is a good study or a bad study through the methodology. So the methodology we're looking for the clinical question we're looking for the study design and the art. We're looking for the subjects who are in this study. We're looking for the intervention. We're looking for the outcome and how to measure it. And the important issue also how to reduce doubt for the bias and the confounding factors within the study itself. So the method, we have the trial design. We have and the participants, if you have a sample size, the sample size has to be a good sample size to reduce uh, or to detect any difference in the intervention. That means we, uh, if it is a good examine, so we can reduce the type 2 errors. Type 2 errors and there's type 1 errors. Uh, we have a study and then we want the results. So the result is at the end, yes. Okay. And there is result at the end, no. That there is yes difference, there is difference. Which are against the null hypothesis. Or that there is no difference. So if we say yes and it is not yes, it is not true. Okay, so this is a false positive. So this is type error one. Okay. And if we have I then say there is no difference in the intervention. There is no benefit. And so, but there is benefit. Okay, so this is a false negative. So this is the type 2 error. So yes is 1, no is 2. Okay. And then we have the sampling and randomization. Sampling is different than randomization. Sampling is just getting, after uh, just we collecting people. Okay. And randomization is allocating them to uh, the groups. And the best way to do this is the concealed allocation. And there is ways for both sampling and randomization, which are simple or, or uh, stratified or quasi or clustered, as uh, Dr. Bassem Sheikh mentioned. And then we go for the intervention, has to be clear there. And then the uh, endpoint, which is either clinical or the primary secondary important it is the, the clinical surrogate that we substitute and point because sometimes we cannot tell mortality or uh, of the patients or cure of the patients so, but we have to monitor a few things we have to monitor blood pressure if it's corrected or some lab results if they are normalized so this is the surrogate and the composite which is composite of and then the other thing which we have to be familiar with that is a statistical analysis, not a complex statistic, but we have to know the general terms of statistics and which is applied to which situation and so forth. And this is not difficult, and there is a few summaries more. Uh, you can find them everywhere and then you can read them and uh, just formulate your own ideas. So the study design, we have, we are just to have it in our mind, we have something we see, something we do. 
see observer, observation, uh, something we do is the experimental. Okay. So when we see something, that observation, so either we describe this thing or we analyze it. So there's descriptive or analytical observation. The descriptive is describing a case report, case series. Observe analytical, which are the uh, uh, control, which are the cohort or case control studies. Okay. And then we have the experimental. We have uh, controlled and uncontrolled. We have randomized and randomized within the control. And they take levels of importance in evidence. The randomized take level one the cohort and case uh, control level 2 and the case uh, reports level 3. We can see it here. It randomized control trial study, uh, uh, trials, case control and cohort studies which level 2 and level 3 is case report the expert paid the last. So we have the clinical question have to match the design. So the Therapy, the one which need the randomized control the trials, but the rest of the studies model that they need the case control study or cohort study, therapy progress and so forth. Uh, so if we uh, we want to talk about the bias, so the bias can occur anywhere. So if we avoid the bias, so the study will be good. If they are biased, the bias will break the uh, the study. Unreliable study. If you notice, there is bias. So there is bias uh, all the way during the research project. So during the selection of patients, there is bias. And there are different names of bias because we can be learned little by little. Four minutes. So during the selection, and performance, observation bias, and attrition that mean drop out when patients either die or they went home. <coughs> So we have to treat this thing, so we treat it by what's called intention to treat analysis. So we can compensate for this dropout and uh, different in the two arms. Yes. So the problem with evidence-based medicine is the time which we have to spend for that, to get familiar with that. And if there is evidence available or not, and possibly at one stage, every step we have to do it in taking decision to have to be uh, backed by evidence-based medicine. Uh, so this is a study done in neurosurgical residents. Uh, two hours every two weeks, they sit and uh, tackle subjects on evidence-based medicine. And they came with uh, just a group of uh, subjects which uh, like uh, uh, on toy fracture and subarachnoid hemorrhage, they are different uh, subjects. I think this is the author of one of the books here. Right? So in conclusion, we have to educate ourselves about evidence-based medicine. We have to improve our competences in clinical epidemiology and method, uh, medical informatics. We uh, have to apply undergraduate and postgraduate. Encourage journal club. The journal clubs is in the journal club itself. We have this critical appraisal process. So I think if we encourage this journal club in all areas, this will improve the evidence-based medicine and improve our research. Uh, capabilities. And we have to use the everyday practice and we have to get access to this and then we have to analyze, criticize and ask why. Probably.